And when one person sets the tone for the propaganda and then just lets it run, crazy stuff happens. And in this case, the Chinese believe, because of their propaganda, that they're so important that no one will really lift a finger. There might be some minor sanctions for a few years, and that's it. On the battlefield, they believe that they could probably capture the island in two weeks because it takes six weeks for the U.S. to sail from San Diego to get there in the first place. So as long as they do it quick, they're fine. You know, let's assume that that's right. That doesn't help their problem with oil tankers transiting by India and Vietnam and the rest. So their belief is that the world won't do anything. And I would say that in the aftermath of Russia, that is a really, really stupid position to take. But in a cult of personality, taking stupid positions is how you show your loyalty in any meaningful way in the Ukraine war. Their economy just can't support it. Their infrastructure can't support it. Their technological system has apparently failed. And their demographics are terminal. So none of these things are likely to get much better. They may be able to eventually fully mobilize and bring more of their industry into the fight. I, I'm a little surprised that hasn't happened already, considering the stakes. But that is for Russia. That is for their near abroad. That is for trying to establish an outer crustal defense. That is not to become an independent pole. And then the Chinese, they're a massive exporter, which means that they need markets to dump all their product on. And so there is no sort of partnership with the, in, with, the, with the Chinese that allows another country to do well. They just become a dumping ground or a source of raw materials. So people might want the dream situation for a lot of countries is the Americans provide the security and the Chinese provide the economic access. But that wasn't ever going to work, even if politics in the United States supported it, which it does not. The Chinese moment is almost over because of demographic situations. So I don't think we'll see a hot war with these two powers. I don't think we'll even see a meaningful Cold War more than a few years with the Chinese. The Russians, the, the, the goal here of the West is to is support Ukraine as much as possible, because as long as Ukraine is in the fight, so long as Ukraine is independent, the Russians can't get that outer crustal defense, and they will be constantly on the strategic defensive until they disassociate. I don't think that's going to happen this decade. I think the Russians have a lot more road ahead of them than the Chinese, but it does put them in a bit of a box. And as for Europe and the rest, to get back to where we were during the Cold War economically, I don't think that's possible either. What made the global system work is the United States subsidized everybody's security systems and then provided global coverage navally so that anyone could ship anything to anywhere. We no longer have a Navy that is built for that. And one of the things we've seen in, say, the Persian Gulf of late is the Iranians have now grabbed, I believe, a half a dozen tankers. And aside from issuing a press release, the U.S. Navy has done nothing. Had that happened in the 70s or the 80s, we would have sunk quite a few Iranian naval assets and probably taken out a few offshore oil platforms to boot. But we no longer have the destroyer-heavy force that is necessary to patrol the seas for global commerce. We're heavy on supercarriers now. And in that sort of environment, we can't provide the security, and you could even argue we can't provide the economic subsidization anymore. Because remember, we now, the United States, does we do have a substantial number of millennials and young people to provide that consumption-led system. Europe no longer does. So there just aren't enough people in wealthy countries that are in that consumption-driven stage of their life to support global commerce anymore. And there's certainly not in Japan or Korea or China or Germany or Italy. So we need a new economic model everywhere except Southeast Asia and North America. There the old system can work, and that's why these systems are getting tighter and tighter and closer to closer together economically, but that is not a global trade order. That's a regional trade order, and that can work but it does leave everyone else on the outside. Oh, absolutely, that's why, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, if you look back at Europe's history, it's a little rough, and so coming up with a political economic model that kept political protest under control and incorporated it into the political system rather than involving shooting, this is a big win for Europe. But because of the urbanization trend, it's it's been a one-off. What we're going to see over the next decade, maybe two decades, is as the United States pulls away from maintaining the economic coherence of the broader system, the EU, I think, is going to go away. As the Germans hit mass retirement this decade, it's going to be impossible for the Germans to pay for the existence of the European Union. If you take the single biggest 
provider of funds and turn them into a net beneficiary, there's no way the EU can survive in that environment. You will have countries leading the left and right with probably the French the first out the door. The French, ironically, have one of the best demographies in the advanced world. And so the idea of France being the single largest payer in the EU in order to subsidize the existence of Germany, oh my, I don't see that happening. The German, or sorry, the French plan since the beginning is to get the Germans to pay for everything. It's not going to work once we get to that point which means that we're going to get a regional breakup of the European system. You'll probably get a Scandinavian network where the demographics are pretty good and the partnership with London and Washington is tight. We're seeing that already with the Swedes and the Finns moving towards NATO. You'll definitely get to get a Francophone world that is all its own. Iberia will probably, under Mexican sponsorship, apply for NATO membership. And then there's the big open question of what happens in Central Europe because that's where the demographic decline is most extreme. And unlike the Italians, they're on the wrong side of the Alps. They can't be a pocket power by themselves. That's easy for the US to pick up. It's just too big of an area with too entrenched of economic issues. And so the question in the United States will be, are there countries in the future for Europe that we are willing to pay for them to continue to exist? And before you rule that out completely, remember, we've done that for Israel and Armenia and Egypt and Jordan for a very long time. So it, you can't rule it out. It's just that Germany is a lot of water to carry. That's a big place with a big economy and supporting it will not be cheap. This is not Greece. This is a real hefty place. It'll be expensive. But in the aftermath of the Battle of Kharkiv, when the Ukrainians captured so much Russian equipment, that logic largely went away. And any direct strike on the United States will be met with an immediate retaliation. And the United States has made it very clear to Vladimir Putin personally that if you think you can fling a nuke into the Western Hemisphere, the first few that come back are coming for you personally. And we know exactly where you are because we've been listening to your phone calls and reading your emails since the beginning of this and then publishing everything immediately. So don't think that you're insulated from this if you decide to go down that route. So I think that is off the table so long as the battle remains within Ukraine. Now, as for the, the curtain, it's a little less, it's a lot less substantial than it was during the Cold War. And that all had to do with the Battle of Kiev. When it became apparent that the Russians were incompetent, not just at combined warfare, combined arms warfare, but warfare in general, that this was just a mob with weapons, everyone in Washington got really scared because we know that when the Russians are done with Ukraine, they're coming for Poland and NATO 